Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Sign up for GoToMeeting using promo code STAR to begin your free trial. And MailChimp. Manage a list with up to 2,000 subscribers and send 12,000 emails per month for free with MailChimp. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. This is This Week in Startups. David Sachs is back on the program. It's been 225 episodes since his last visit, and boy, has a lot changed. Stick with us, and you're going to hear about an amazing story of success. Hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. Let me just thank our friends at tag.com. They do uh, friendship discovery, people discovery, an amazingly innovative company. Great place to work, by the way. They lent us their studio here and uh, here in San Francisco and been using it for the last uh, couple of days. And boy, what a great studio it is and a great team. So uh, thanks to Greg and the team here at Tagged. On the program today, David Sachs is back with us. You were on episode five, five yeah. uh, back when we started the program two and a half years right. ago or something. And at the time, you were running Genie. Mm -hmm. And Yammer, which had just launched at the TechCrunch 50 show and won. Right. And I think, how big was Yammer when you won TechCrunch 50? Well, uh, well, we launched it on stage. On stage, as right. As you may recall, yeah. I remember. And uh, we got our first 50,000 users and 10,000 networks. Wow. So the first week, which was great. That's amazing. That got the ball rolling. Right. But how many yeah. people in the company? Did you have at that point? Like, how many people yeah. built the original? How much work went into the original Yammer that you showed at the event in um, 2008? I guess that was. Yeah. 2009. So we, 2009. Yeah, we started coding it in January 2008. So about nine months earlier, it was two guys. Right. Uh, the, the person who's now the CTO, Adam Pizzoni, and one of our directors of engineering, Zach Parker, kind of started working on it. And then uh, we used the original version inside Genie for about six months. Um, and then by the time we launched it, we actually had a team of probably around a dozen people. Right. Um, so you launch it on stage, mm -hmm. you win. We won, yeah. Which was crazy. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that was pretty exhilarating. You won the $50,000 yeah. prize. Right. Not that you guys needed it. Right. But you had started another company for the two years before that. You were working on Genie. Mm -hmm. And you pivoted, mm -hmm. I guess, or created a second company inside of Genie. Yeah, How did I that mean, happen? Well, so, so what kind of happened is we started... Genie in mid-2006, launched it early 2007 with the premise of creating a family social network. Mm -hmm. So at that point, Facebook was still primarily in college campuses. Uh, MySpace was actually the dominant social network. And um, so the, the lay of the land was very different, uh, right. right? We didn't think that MySpace would become the family anything, right? Because the content was very raw and it was very unstructured. And, um, and so we thought there was a niche for, uh, an important niche for a family social network. So we started working on that. And by the end of 2007, I became very concerned that Facebook was going to just eat that space. Right. Uh, they had opened up uh, registration. And it was yeah. now growing very fast. They had to kind of launch a platform. Uh, and so we kind of pivoted in two ways. One was that we had Genie shift from family social networking to collaborative genealogy. And so uh, today the company, it's, you know, it's still, still around. We, yeah. we promoted the VP of product to, to CEO. Uh, Noah Tutak, he's running it. We actually became profitable last year. We've got over 7 million users. Wow. So the company has carved out a sort of um, related but slightly different mission in terms of gene sort of going after the genealogy space from a kind of collaborative social point of view. Right. But the other thing we did is we took about uh, half our resources and uh, shifted them onto this side project in corporate social networking. Mm -hmm. So like I said, beginning of 2008, we started working on this as a side project. Right. It started out as a tool that we just primarily used at Genie, uh, and then after we won TechCrunch 50, we spun it out into a separate company. Wow! And raise some money. Mm -hmm. And where is it today? Because the company mm -hmm. is—I mean, I just read something that you raised 85 million dollars. I don't know if that's right. confirmed or not. Is it? Yeah, it's it confirmed. Is. Yes. So launched in 2008, 2009. It's just three or four years later, you've raised. Eighty-five million dollars. How many employees are working on this? How many right. networks are there? I mean, what, what's the footprint of the yeah. company just three or four years later? Yeah. So um, we've raised one hundred forty-two million dollars total. So eighty-five of which was this this growth round that we just did. Yeah. Um, DFJ led the round with participation from 
Kosla, Meritech, um, Capricorn, and then all of our uh, previous investors participated. So um, a CRV, Founders Fund, uh, Emergence, Social Capital, uh, and USVP. So, um, so yeah, so we just did this, this big big round. We, um, there's about 300 employees at the company now. Wow. Um, we have operations in the U.S., uh, Europe, Australia, uh, sort of as our uh, launching point for, for Asia. Uh, in terms of users, we have over 4 million corporate users, hmm. which um, it's hard to kind of benchmark these things. I know that yeah. compared to Facebook, that doesn't sound like a lot, but in the enterprise... These are paying users. Well, so about 20% uh, of them are, right. are paid seats. So, right. um, so it's about over 4 million corporate users, uh, almost 20% of them are, are paid. Uh, we have over uh, 200,000 uh, unique domains now uh, where Yammer is being used. Wow. So those are some of the, the highline numbers. Just yeah. to give you some, so just a point of comparison, it took Salesforce.com uh, about uh, 12 years to get to 3 million users, and it took us about three years to get 3 million users. Now we're kind of well past that. And so, that's because this is so much more viral. It's designed as a social network, right. whereas Salesforce was designed as contact management, CRM, right. really. Yeah, I'm not trying to pick on them. I'm just giving yeah, you as yeah. a benchmark because it's just so much harder to acquire users in the corporate space. So sure. Just giving you some and, you, and it was the bottom up to get those users. Right. I mean, that is the secret, isn't it? Like, mm -hmm. you can start your Yammer network without the permission of the IT department, whereas Salesforce, right. it's so expensive that you really have to go through IT and get it set up. Free is a big... Freemium is a big part of the success of this, right? Well, they, they, they went through the line of business owner sales usually, yeah. but um, but nonetheless, I think you're right that our uh, sort of our secret of success has been this sort of uh, grassroots bottom-up adoption, right. and so the movement we're really leading is consumerization of the enterprise, right? Where employees now feel empowered to make technology decisions that were previously reserved exclusively for kind of IT or technology decision makers. Um, the employees are going out and finding the tools that make them most productive and are just proactively bringing them inside the enterprise. So is that the death of IT? Is it the... No, I mean, I, I think IT... Collaborative IT? Yeah. What does it become? Because well, I, I started yeah. at my career in IT and mm -hmm. that was our bread and butter. You came to us with your request and then we mm -hmm. came back with like, here's your options and or here's the option, go. Mm -hmm. Six months later. Right. So I, I still think companies need IT to make decisions about security, reliability, integration with other systems, um, policy. High level stuff. P policy. Um, but where users should really make the decision uh, is about things like usability, value, ROI, uh, adoption. You know, the users are the best position to tell you whether the tool is actually valuable. Yeah, uh, if not, it's working. Exactly. So what, what we're saying, so what consumerization is about is not eliminating IT. It's about kind of involving more parties in the decision. Mm -hmm. So it used to be, you know, 20 years ago, before the cloud, right. IT made all the decisions because... Uh, installing any piece of enterprise software was this big, it was an ordeal, right? You had to buy sure. hardware, you had to install on servers, you had to make right. sure... Sometimes proprietary hardware. Exactly. That you had yeah. to make sure it was compatible with the other systems, it didn't break, it was very expensive, it was hard to maintain. Yeah. So in a world like that, IT really had to make all the decisions. Um, mm -hmm. But then the cloud came along and started to decentralize it. So Salesforce was kind of a midpoint where you still had IT making decisions about security. If you didn't sort of pass the security threshold, right. then they wouldn't let you in. So, mm -hmm. you know, Yammer spends a lot of time with enterprise IT talking about security, explaining why, you know, this is not a risk. Um, right. And so, but what, so what the cloud did is say that we're going to rely on IT for what it's good at, but line of business owners are going to start making decisions about value. Mm -hmm. And so it was the VP of sales who really brought Salesforce in in the early days. Right. What we're now saying is that you're still going to have IT for security. You're going to have line of business owners for to define needs, mm -hmm. but it's the users who can tell you where you know what what the best tool is. Like right. what tool is going to get has the best usability? Which one has the features we actually need? Not some right. arbitrary checklist. And so it's it's a it's involving more parties in the decision so that companies end up with software that employees actually want to use. Right. And now, does that mean the IT department resents when this process is happening? Or is, there, is IT uh, liberated by this because they don't have to own implementing bad decisions because the owners now pick mm -hmm. They're tools. Right. I mean, in a yeah. way, it sounds like it's much more liberating for them because you can't tell me that you don't like the tool that you picked. Right. So, right, exactly. So it should be liberating that they don't have to be a cheerleader for adoption anymore because now ah, yeah. they don't have to, they don't risk buying an expensive system that turns out to be shelfware because the right. employees don't adopt it. Shelfware, so, right. Yeah, so the biggest problem with all enterprise software is that it doesn't actually get used. 
right? There's, this, uh, I mean, how many times have companies spent a fortune buying some complicated system and then it doesn't get adopted? Yeah, so people, and that might be three, four hundred dollars a seat per year right. for Lotus Notes or some craziness right. when I was in IT. Right. And then half the people don't use it. Right. So without adoption, there is no ROI. And so we are de-risking the central risk of enterprise software is that you're not going to get value out of it. We're saying you don't even have to talk to us until your employees are actually getting value out of the software. Right. So um, our conversation starts when you've extracted value right. from we our product. Right. We are guaranteeing value. We're guaranteeing adoption before you even have to pay for it, which is new. We're letting you try it and before you buy it. Wow. And that's something that's scary, I guess, for the IBMs of the world or those big people who would sell stuff into them and say, like, we know you're not going to get value out of this. Right. <laughs> My God. Well, it's, the worst thing, it's the worst thing in the world for a, a, a lot of these established enterprise vendors because yeah. they know that if their product actually could be used in an extensive way before the they would never buy it, it would never work. And, you know, so their argument is, well, well of course it won't work without you putting in uh, tons of time deploying it, right? You've got to train everyone how to use this. You've got to, you know, ro write up your plans. I mean, it's this whole process, right? And we're saying, well, no, you should be able to get started with it at right. least right out of the box. Uh, like, why is it that Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest or whatever you want to name, they yeah. don't, or Dropbox, they don't require any uh, training to get started. Right. Now, there's a lot of advanced functionality that we've added that, that do require you to, uh, to integrate with other systems to get the most out of it. But to get started, you should just be able to sign up and, and, and start using road. it. So the criticism uh, from the judges back in the day at the event was, um, it's just Twitter for enterprise. Twitter will come out with this. Mm -hmm. And I remember your answer was like, well, we're going to focus on this problem. It's much bigger than just Twitter for enterprise, mm -hmm. and we're going to just out-execute, and we'll be more focused on this problem. And they've got a different series of problems right. they're focused on. Right. It never came out. Right. Well, Four yeah, years I, later, it's never right. come out. Right. It turns out that serving the enterprise and serving consumers are very different propositions. And, right. um so we started with uh, this, this metaphor, sort of enterprise microblogging, but right. the products kind of rapidly evolved beyond that. Um, so we, we never had the 140 character limit, so we were never truly microblogging. Right. Um, we uh, rapidly added conversations, so it's sort of like fully threaded, like, right. like more like on Facebook, right. uh, which is more suitable, I think, for, for companies. Uh, that was a lesson you guys learned. It should look more like Facebook than Twitter. Yeah. That's a better metaphor. It's it, Facebook's more fully featured, right? It's a right. full application platform. So, um, so yeah, we've kind of evolved um, to include applications. So you can do there's app, apps like praising coworkers, uh, posting polls and questions, uh, ideas. Uh, you can search expertise. Um, we have groups now. There's file sharing within groups. Um, so in a way, this is becoming like the Novell Networks or something of an enterprise. Like it's your name database, mm -hmm. your database of employees. I mean, you're plugging in. You started with a sort of basic premise. It's a place for us to just you know talk about stuff, and it's for office chatter and information. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's you've added these pieces. You know. Right. So so we think okay so. In the world before enterprise social networking, you had a bunch of uh, disparate systems. So you got like an identity system somewhere, and you've got yeah. your content management system somewhere, and your knowledge management system. And there might be some sort of employee profiles or an intranet that's kind of like brochureware, and people aren't really using it. Um, what we've done is, I think we're going to end of life pretty much all those categories of software. And end just, of life. Yeah. Done. So, done. You make them a even, feature. Even, I think, uh, a lot of email, like mail lists. Uh, so I think all these different systems get replaced with the idea of an enterprise social network, which, again, is, it starts with the core being people, hmm. uh, identity, feeds, so the conversations occur in feeds, and then you've got applications layered on top of that, uh, That, but it, they're they're deeply embedded in the social fabric of the site. Right. So you take um, a feature like Pages, which is our kind of next generation wiki right. uh, within the site. And what's great about this is that you can follow pages. So when someone makes a change, you immediately get an alert notifying in you. In your feed. In your feed. Uh, well, it's in, we have a ticker. So you see changes in the ticker, but you also get kind of, there's a notification tray, right. kind of like on, on Facebook. Yep. Uh, people can post uh, comments on So on it's the a page. better Google Docs in a way. I mean, that, you're going up against the office sort of space. Like people who have a choice. I put up a wiki, mm -hmm. do I put up a, a Google Docs? Mm -hmm. Well, this is more like being able to create a web page, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Docs are kind of turning into web pages, but this right. is something that it would be more of an uh, internet yeah. replacement, I would say. Um, but, you know, what's cool is that because this thing is integrated into the social fabric of the site, you can see who else is following the page. You can, right. it's just, you can create messages around it. Discovery. Uh, discovery. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's much easier to, to find these things. Right. So, one login, one exactly. place. Exactly. 
Hello, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, the host of This Week in Startups. One of the great things about having this program is that I get to pick the sponsors, and we only pick the sponsors based upon the products and services that myself or Tyler Crowley, my partner here, uh, use. And one of those products that I use all the time is MailChimp. That's how I send my email newsletter. As you guys know, two years ago, I quit blogging, started doing email, and that list grew to over 20,000 members. I needed a way to manage that massive list. I couldn't use this desktop software. I needed software as a service. I got MailChimp. Um, and one of the best features of MailChimp, I have it here on my screen uh, that I'll show you, is I can segment my list. So here is my list. I'm clicking the segment button. And uh, here look at, look I get that interface. It's just a beautiful interface. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a gorgeous interface. And I can say, hey, show me all the people who are, have been added to the list uh, after a specific date. So here I go. I say, hey, I want just the people who have signed up this month. And now I can segment and say, hey, just show me who signed up this month. Hey, here's the 81 people. Now I've got all the 81 people here. I, I hope well, I can't show all their emails. But um, <laughs> I can just click the Send To button right here. And when I click that Send To button, now I'm just sending to those 81 people. This is called segmenting your list, which is a great thing to do. And you can segment it by location or any information that you collect from users or some information you don't collect. Uh, one interesting thing you could do is, and here's a list of all the different ways you can segment. By first name, by last name, I can email all the Tylers on the list, by what company they're at, their job function, what they're interested in, because I ask people what they're interested in. So I can say, hey, if you're only interested in venture capital, I'm only going to email you about that, gender, location. Uh, but hey, look at that, CloudScore. Remember we had um, uh, Joe Marchese from CloudScore, and I could say, give me people who have a, <laughs> a CloudScore that is great. Fernandez, I think you mean. What's that? Joe Fernandez. Who did I say? Marchese. Oh, Joe Marchese is another entrepreneur. God, I'm sorry. I'm tired sometimes. Right. Uh, it's Joe. You, you just came back from New York just for this, huh? I just is it back here, yeah. So anyway, the cloud score is greater than 20. Boom. Uh, show me the people who are, you know, oh, that's 500 people. That's too much. Let me just make it 30 here. So show me the people who have cloud scores over 30. Boom, here's the 360 people. I can just start emailing to just them. Um, so I could, if I wanted to give a free ticket, I can go all the way up the list. I can say, hey, well, over 40, over 50, over 70. Uh, who are the really powerful people here? on the list and uh, boy you know I got the right people on the list I don't want to show their emails um, but an incredibly powerful tool uh, go check it out the free plan is always uh, free and this is one of the nice things they give if you have a small list like only 2,000 people or less and you do under 12,000 emails a month they do it free and they just charge you as you go you get these sort of MailChimp points um, and it's just an amazing product so thank you to them for being a partner on the program and Thank you for uh, your attention to the sponsors. Without them, independent media like this trip to New York where we shot a bunch of great episodes would not be possible, uh, or the trips to San Francisco or to London. Um, it's a, it costs a lot of money to, to produce high-quality content like this in HD uh, and do it on a consistent basis. And without partners like MailChimp, we couldn't do it. Thank you, thank you, MailChimp. <laughs> MailChimp. And so does... Dropbox or Box.com become competitors to Yammer eventually, or do do they start going and encroaching into your application layer? Because mm -hmm. you know they, it seems like Dropbox wants to build a very independent company that is just for a long time, and right. in order to do that, they have to be more than files. Right. I mean, you would agree well, with I, that? I don't know. Um, I mean, now you have G Drive coming out. You have mm -hmm. other places where you can put files. I mean. They seem to have, want to put a little more application to put the sort of right. photo application on top of it. It's sort of consumer, but they came out with the groups thing. Well, what's so beautiful about Dropbox is that um, it's just so simple, right? right. So, and you know, the other thing that's great about it is just plumbing, right? You just kind of set it up once, yeah, and then you don't really think about it again. Yeah, um, I don't know how that changes if all of a sudden they want to move into kind of collaboration other right. areas. I mean, I, I don't know. I, it, but it would be a feature that if you have a lot of content management going on mm -hmm. on your side, assets. Right. And people do use Yammer lightly for file sharing, mm -hmm. would you say? Yeah, so so I guess our view, to, so first of all, we have a, a partnership with, with Box. So right. you can do things like when you're inside Box, you can easily push a file into Yammer and have a conversation about it. We want to make it work the other way too, where you click a paper clip in Yammer to add a file to your message. Right now you can add it from your hard drive, you can add it from Yammer if the file's already there. We want you to be able to add it from Box, from Dropbox, from ah, G Drive. So be, ag be agnostic uh, to exactly. what Drive. So our view is, you know, we know the hard drive is moving to the cloud. Uh, we want to let you add files from wherever your files happen to be. It could be your hard drive, it could be one of your cloud hard drives. We don't feel like we have to own uh, right. your hard drive in the cloud. But um, isn't that hard drive in the cloud going to get commoditized? Isn't that like the ante? I mean, sort of table stakes now. 
You'd well, I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah. this is why you know we our goal is we're not setting out to uh, to get into the content management space. That's not right. sort of our objective. What we're doing is just adding what we see as a useful application right. on top of the enterprise social network. And right. so the application is file sharing right. uh, within mainly within Teams. Um, and you know you'll get you know at least a basic level of file sharing. And then if you need more, you know we want to integrate with kind of whatever your yeah, dedicated content management system is. Um, and what about CRM? What about managing relationships and that kind of stuff? You see, are there plugins for that already mm -hmm. that third parties are starting to make to? Yeah, we so, have a Salesforce integration. So yeah. all of the, the activity feeds that you get in Salesforce, you can now pull into Yammer and they'll appear right. in your ticker. So yeah. just like you, know, you can see in Facebook what music your friends are listening to or right. what they're reading, you can now see in Yammer you know, what actions are taking in Salesforce or NetSuite or Box. So somebody or just called this client mm -hmm. or somebody just did this with right. this client. They're going to lunch. I should at least let them know that I just talked to them over right. the weekend at a kid's soccer game or something. Yeah, I mean, that's serendipity or whatever. Yeah, so our, our, our um, philosophy, obviously they're not going to do everything. We don't right. want to, um, there's a lot of enterprise software companies out there that want to be your complete stack for everything, right? So right. like Oracle, Salesforce is kind of moving in that direction. Yeah, I mean Salesforce is coming into your backyard. They have mm -hmm. like sort of the crosshairs on you guys, do they not? Well, they have yeah, the competing product called Chatter, right. which... I mean, um, I see it on the cover of the mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal for a year mm -hmm. I did. Maybe I haven't seen mm -hmm. it in a long time, but they were buying the ads yeah, they're pushing, pretty heavily. Yeah, they're pushing it pretty hard. But I think the thing to realize about Chatter is it's basically an activity feed for what's happening in Salesforce. Got right? It. So it's, it's useful for getting a record of you know when people change an opportunity from open to closed or change a, a dollar yeah. amount of opportunity. You see those record changes, Yeah. but that's pretty much all it is. Like those... Right. those um, sort of system generated messages are mm -hmm. coming at such a fast velocity that it actually drowns out when humans want to just talk into the feed. Right. So Yammer is more about collaboration, right. Salesforce is more about um, transactions, I, I think. Yeah. So this is why we actually bring, but you know, but we don't we don't think that every enterprise tool should be should build a social network into itself. Right. So this is why we're integrating the Salesforce feed, we're pulling but we're also pulling in feeds from NetSuite, SharePoint and so on. Right. So we want you to be able to get all of your feeds in in Yammer. Uh, and so do you think, though, all enterprise will become one login to all services eventually? Do you think that's the goal? You know, it seems like Google really wants to try to provide every service possible in Google Docs right now mm -hmm. and get capture as much attention. And it seems like Salesforce is doing that. Is it, right. is it going so to be have possible a, we have a to be? Approach. Yeah. So, so we, for instance, we have Yammer Connect, which, right. like Facebook Connect, allows third party developers to uh, to let their users sign up and log in using their Yammer identity. Right. So, um, so there, you, there's just a Yammer Connect button on it. You click it, boom, you're now signed into this third-party site yeah. with your Yammer account, and they have all your profile information. They can actually access your uh, your your contacts, so mm. they can potentially get some virality out of it. It's mirrored a lot after the Facebook platform. So. Right. We, for the foreseeable future, we think that enterprises are going to be using multiple vendors. Right. So, so they may have Zendesk and they might have Salesforce. Right. And they're going to have Box.com, right. formerly Net. And they're right. just going to. Yeah. So we're a social Switzerland. Mm -hmm. We want to. We have a platform approach. We want to work with every everyone. We want to take these basic horizontal components. Uh, I mean, the the apps that we're going to focus on are the horizontal ones, the ones that everyone in the company needs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's stuff like profiles and identity. It's stuff like, uh, you know. Uh, some degree of, of file sharing, conversations, right. Right. and so on. Uh, but we're not going to get into like departmental apps like CRM. You know, that's what our integration or platform would be for. Right. And so, what what is the biggest success story to date with the platform? I mean, is there a client who's just it's transformed their organization, mm -hmm. um, or is it just you know sort of incrementally making communication better? I mean, that's mm -hmm. the number one thing people say when they're given a survey in a company, right? Like, how could the company mm -hmm. be better? Oh, our communication sucks. Like, everybody right. rates every company right. I've ever worked in or mm -hmm. invested in is like, communication's terrible. Right. I mean, is communication just always terrible in these companies? And is the product had some sort of transformative effect typically? Mm -hmm. Or is it just sort of iron out some of the, you know, the mistakes that get made? What, what's the practical application of Yammer? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of basic use cases, right? right? Like asking a question where you don't know who has the answers. Uh, someone will, will post an answer. Finding expertise in the company. Working in, in teams without having to go through IT to set up some sort of mail list or, or work group. So there's a lot of these, these basic use cases. But to your point about business transformation, I think Yammer actually works best when the company is actually looking for that kind of transformation. So uh, we have uh, one of our customers is a Fortune 100 grocery store called Super Value. They own brands like... Albertsons, sure. Jewel, Osco, we've all yeah. shopped there. They've got something like 5,000 stores all over the U.S. And, um, 
you know, it used to be that uh, the CEO of the company would, would get to, to meet his store managers once a year at an annual conference. Now they've got all their store managers on Yammer. A lot of them are logging in with their iPhones and iPads. Because they're in the store. They're in the store. They don't want to be in the back on a PC. They want to be on the store floor. Sure. And they're doing things like uploading ideas, sharing best practices, taking photographs of displays that are working, merchandising that's working. And everybody sees it. And everyone sees it right away. So these guys are constantly sharing ideas now. And so they're actually, they did a study uh, over, uh, of uh, stores that were participating saw something like a 13% increase in uh, holiday sales because of ideas that were shared on Yammer. Wow. So it's been a huge impact for them. It's not only allowed best practice sharing among stores, but it's allowed corporate headquarters to have much more visibility into what's happening ah, in their stores. Sure. So now the whole company just feels much more connected. So it's, it's really been transformative. It's, you know, the CEO has set out this, this vision, which he calls radical transparency. He's trying to make his whole organization more transparent, and Yammer's been an absolutely vital part of that. Um, you tweeted recently about Yahoo mm -hmm. and the patent right. issue. I have to ask you, you've been pretty right. vocal about it. Um, <laughs> Yahoo has become a patent troll, Yeah. in your opinion? Well, they basically, by suing Facebook on the eve of their IPO, this very opportunistic type of lawsuit. It's a shakedown. It's a shakedown, like a patent troll would. Yeah. Um, they're basically saying that this is an acceptable line of business, right? That, right. That we're going to get value. A revenue line. Right, yeah. exactly. This is a new business for us, is we're right. going to take our 10,000 patents and try and extract whatever we can. And, um, you know, the, the danger of this, I mean, the reason why I've spoken out is I think it's kind of a watershed moment for Silicon Valley, because if these large established tech companies with these huge patent portfolios of thousands and thousands of patents. Now see this as a line of business. I think it's really going to uh, yeah. crimp innovation in, in Silicon Valley. And would that trickle all the way down to investing in startups? I mean, would they shake so. down startups? I mean, it's one thing to shake down Facebook on the eve of their IPO and try to get a billion dollars, which Yahoo did successfully, mm -hmm. I think, with the Overture patents. Well, the patent trolls already are. Yeah. So they're moving down the food chain. They are moving down the uh, yes. food chain. Yes. So what, what kind of woke me up to this issue? I mean, I've been hearing about it for years, but right. what kind of woke me up is uh, a little over a month ago, Yammer got sued by its first uh, patent troll. First patent troll. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is a non-practicing entity. It's basically a company that only exists to litigate on behalf of a patent. They have no operations. Right. But somehow they're claiming to be damaged uh, by us. Yeah. Uh, they sued us and eight other uh, companies on the same day. It was like Facebook, Salesforce, and but like Glam Media. It was like... It was such a motley group of companies that you wonder how we could all be infringing this, the same time. Weird. Was it for what? Using a mouse? Clicking on a <laughs> web page? Hyperlinks? What was it? Images it was, on web pages? It was, it was some social networking patent that they had, uh, oh. acquired from a company that's now defunct. And these are bogus software patents. These are right. patents around not even the code. Right. It's, it's around the concept of the software. Right. A, a piece of software that allows you to make a payment through the web. Right. Remotely. Exactly. Or, yeah, exactly. Or, so one of the, the claims that Yahoo is making, one of their patents is uh, a website with advertising on it. That's, that's the patent. A website with advertising, right, exactly. as opposed to a television show or the right. information. So how do we solve all this? I mean, what's the, I mean you right. had some radical, I mean, well, it's, it's, I think yeah. somewhat gangster as well response to, which was, you shouldn't work at the Yahoo. Right. And well, I, if yeah. you do, you shouldn't work at any other Silicon Valley company if you don't leave. Right. I mean, that's pretty charged stuff, David. Yeah, well, so I've been iterating my proposal. I've, been, I've, okay. I've iterated from the stick to the carrot. So that what I've recently announced is that any employee who leaves Yahoo to join Yammer in the next 60 days will give a $25,000 signing bonus to. Wow. So I'm trying to create a little bit of motivation for employees at Yahoo to reassess whether they want to work at a patent troll or not. It's, a, it's and I, truly sad. And the reason sad. I'm doing that is to try and create pressure on Yahoo to not go into this as a line of business. Yeah, and do you think they're going to be successful? I mean, it, we both have met Zuck, and like, we know people around him. He mm -hmm. doesn't seem like the type of person who minds being deposed. <laughs> I mean, I saw the film. He kind of looked like he was kind of enjoying it in the documentary. You saw the documentary, The Social Network, yes? Right. <laughs> right. Well, Sean Parker the, was in it. Right. Well, there's a, there's a line that's very apropos here, which is, if you would have invented Facebook, you would have invented Facebook. Right. And that applies to Yahoo as well. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone likes being deposed, obviously. I, here, here's the th what, what's problematic about these lawsuits is, yes, Facebook could fight and win, mm -hmm. but it's going to cost them a lot of money to do it, and it's risky because, you know, if a jury, which, you know, who aren't experts in technology You're or right. patent law, come up with the right verdict, it could be very damaging. So mm -hmm. this, this is the structural incentives are to settle these things. And right. so what happens is everyone quietly pays pays people off, and that's why the problem gets worse and worse. So they're, they're now the signal is we're rewarding the trolling. 
and well, it's, it's gone up the food chain to the desperate internet giants. Well, you never negotiate with terrorists except in each particular instance, and that's basically what's been happening for several years, and the problem's been getting worse and worse. So it's become like a plague now in Silicon Valley. And just to go back to the point I was making about us getting sued, this happened before we closed the $85 million round. So it's not like they knew they that saw we had this the big, 85. Yeah, it's not like they knew we had the yeah. big pile of, of cash. Right. Um, so I don't know why they wouldn't keep moving sort of down the food chain, right? Of because course. Because it doesn't cost them anything to file a claim. It's a piece of paper, you file it. It costs potentially millions of dollars to defend yourself in court. So the incentives are to settle these things. Right. And now there's a prior art website where you can, I forgot the name of it, where you, though you can put a reward up for finding mm -hmm. prior art to help negate right. patents. Right. Is it going to take a systematic approach like your idea of maybe boycotting or um, maybe uh, you know, hiring away all the employees and shaming them? I mean. It seems like there is no legal ramification here. It right. needs to be done in a more industry-wide approach. Right. Well, we absolutely need the patent laws to be changed to make it harder yeah. to file these kinds of bogus patent lawsuits. I'm actually, from a policy standpoint, um, I would like to return to the, the regime we had in place before a bunch of court decisions in the 1970s that said that software programs could be protected by patents. I mean, my own view is that software is much more like a novel or a movie right. than it is like a pharmaceutical drug. So, you know, imagine if somebody you know, like Charles Dickens could patent the novel or, yeah. you know, or the, the idea or, of a protagonist who is an orphan right. Right, who exactly. runs away like from home genres. and is abused. Yeah. Like imagine if Warner Brothers could have patented the, the Western. Yeah. Right. You, Star Wars. You, you can't, can, exactly. Yeah. So what, what patents are doing is allowing companies to, to, to get a monopoly on genres of functionality. Right, which is it, ridiculous. It's ridiculous that this should not exist. The, the way to protect code is copyright law, which is to say you cannot copy this. You cannot plagiarize. Can't cut and paste you, it. Exactly. You and can't we know plagiarize when my you do. Code. You can't plagiarize my novel. You can't plagiarize sure. my song. But if you get inspired by something somebody does, you can create your own version of it. Sure. We want that feature war to take place. This is what powers innovation in Silicon Valley is the feature war that you takes place. You uh, had SocialCast as a competitor. I don't know if they came out before or after you guys did, but you guys were in a little feature war for a mm. while and I think they wound up getting bought. But right. it made you both better, right? It was right. a pretty so contentious now, relationship there. Right. Right, so... Um, and Salesforce is contentious. Salesforce is copying us. You know, we've been inspired by what Twitter and Facebook have done. You know, who's to say that, you know, have we infringed on someone's patent? I mean, we would see this as an original idea. I'm sure Salesforce would see what they're doing as an original idea. It's, I don't think it serves consumers when to try and prevent this competition. When are you copying and when are you inspiring? I mean, when, when are you... What's the line for you with, like, the Samwar brothers, for example? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of those guys who are mm -hmm. copy Pinterest down to the pixel. I mean, right. is there a difference between photocopying somebody's site, I mean, mm -hmm. and evolving a concept? I mean, how, right. how do you know the difference? Well, so so there are sites, like, in China, which are, they've created, like, a Yammer clone assist in Chinese. But we right. can go in there and see that they've actually lifted our graphics. They've actually taken, pixel like... Pixel by pixel replication. Yeah, they've just, like, copied and... They've taken some of our, our uh, assets. Right. And uh, they've even gone into, like, the HTML, which you can obviously access, and just, like, started coding from there. You can see they've yeah. just made some, some, some changes. <laughs> That's not okay, right? You right. should not be able to plagiarize. But it's not really, I think, again, you have to ask, from a policy standpoint, what's in consumers' interest. It's not in anyone's interest to create a lawsuit to deter, to arbitrate when somebody you know, has a truly novel expression that's just riffing off your previous idea yeah. as opposed to what might be too blatant a copy. I mean, is this, we shouldn't even go there. I think, you know, originality it pr provides its own reward in this business, right? The reason to win the feature reward, to innovate, is to have the best product and you get rewarded for that. We don't want to stand in the way of that by saying that we came out with this feature first, therefore no one can copy it. I mean, that's just a horrible sort of precedent it's, to set. And it sort of says our creativity is over now. Like, our ability exactly. to innovate has ended today. Totally. And I mean that in a way is what Yahoo has said, isn't it? Well, they've said we suck. Yeah, I mean it's 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 basically uh, it's starting to create a path which if we keep going down, if Silicon Valley keeps going down this path, it will result in, in what you're saying, which is it'll just be way too hard to innovate in in any area where there are established patents and should all the companies in Silicon Valley get together and have a patent treaty? Yes. And just say like Yahoo, uh, Yahoo, Google, Apple, and these mid-tier companies will we'll bring our software patents together. Yes. Put them in a bucket. Yes. Create a new organization, and we defend against trolls. Yes, I would like to see a non-aggression treaty on the part of Silicon Valley companies. I think we should. Has anybody talked about doing that yet? I don't know. I think there should be a pledge, which is it's simple. I will not start patent litigation against somebody if they sue me first. 
I will counter sue. Of course. If you know, if it's if it's like two companies that are throwing the kitchen sink at each other, they've got other disputes, they're throwing patents in there. Well, okay, I get it. That's separate. Like kind of like what's going on between Apple and Google. Mm -hmm. You know, those guys have other. They need to work it out. To, Just yeah, go make out. And, yeah, yeah, they got other grievances to work room. out. But, yeah. but I, I think it would be great for Silicon Valley if we all took a pledge not to start offensive patent litigation. Would people sign it? Well, all the entrepreneurs would sign it because they don't have patents. And right. the problem is that the big companies would not sign it because they have they've got huge patent collections. And you know what happens is that everybody starts on the right side of this issue because everyone starts on the side of the entrepreneur and the innovator. But as they become more established and they have more of a vested interest in their own patent collection, and remember they're paying now millions or billions to acquire these patent collections. Like Google acquired Motorola, Motorola for $11 billion mainly for their patent collection. So, I know Google was on the right side of this issue before that acquisition. How do they feel afterwards? I mean, are they really going to want to? They've been give that dragged up? into the mud. Exactly. So people get converted to the dark side, you know. Yeah, and they're like, I'm not giving up this lightsaber. Exactly. Yeah. This is I, I'm going to have to defend myself. <laughs> but they could make it between each other. Right. And that would be enough. Yeah. Should small companies start just filing patents themselves just to? Well, it's the, such a waste of resources. Yeah. Isn't this, it? this is the problem. Is you know. Ever since I was doing PayPal over 10 years ago, we knew, hey, you're supposed to file patents. The problem is, do you really want your engineers taking their time writing these patents instead of coding and building your product? And so it's a tremendous distraction for startups. Mm. And the problem is, when you're a startup, um, you, you can't really litigate these patents anyway. Even if you were to get them, you don't have the legal departments to, to litigate them. They're really only valuable to companies with huge legal departments like Yahoo, which are kind of circling the drain and you know, trying yeah. to invent a new business model or to these patent trolls. And so the problem is, as an entrepreneur, do you really even want to go there? I mean, your goal is to build something real, you know, a product right. that people, it, that meets So the, the answer need. is no, don't waste your time. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very tough. I mean, I think uh, we're at the point now, so Yammer filed one patent when we, when we launched. Um, the problem is, you know, it's written by lawyers, so it's, you know, it, yeah. it, it, with consultation from our engineers, but we didn't want to spend that much time on it. Right. So, uh, could we have filed 100 patents by now? Probably, because we have innovated tremendously in the space of enterprise social networking. Now we're at a point where we have the resources to do this stuff. Yeah. I still would rather not do it, but now we're kind of in this arms race and we have to do it. So now you're gonna have to spend a million dollars a year just filing patents. I don't even know how much it's gonna cost, but yeah, now we have Hundreds to spend, of thousands yeah, of Yeah, it's gonna be expensive, and more important than the, the cash is the distraction. And people in China and other countries are not gonna respect it anyway. Right? Well, There's a lot of these countries where they don't seem to care. Yeah, I mean, so what happens in China is less concerning to me than what happens in, in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, but, uh, but I think that it's, it, the issue is do we want our engineers developing features that will help our customers, that will be great for you know, hey. consumers, or do we want them working on patents? It's, yeah. just, it's just the wrong priorities. Hey everybody, I want to tell you about one of my all-time favorite products, GoToMeeting. I use GoToMeeting religiously because it's stable, it's feature rich, and I want to show you a couple of the features today that will blow your mind, guaranteed. Here is my desktop computer. Boom, you're seeing it side by side. Now look, I've got Microsoft Word loaded here. I've got a browser window open here, uh, and I can very simply I've got Carolyn on the line here, our producer, and she's in HD. Look how gorgeous, that perfect HD video. And now, the, you know, like, the fact that we can do a nice video conference, you'd expect that from GoToMeeting, right? This is a right. great company. But I'm gonna show you a couple of features that most people don't even know they can do. I can give entire control of my desktop to any individual who is on the conference. So if I say, hey, Carolyn, in production, you want to take over and show us what we're talking about? So now I can just give her my desktop, which I have, and she can just go do a, she can just do a Google search here, and boom, before you know it, we're going to see a Google search. And she's going there and typing in This Week in Startups, and on my screen, we're seeing that. Great. You'd expect that. But now we could also be working in Microsoft Word and editing a document together. All amazing. But what's more amazing is Tyler, who's, you know, he's on the road a lot. He's a very important guy. He's logged in on? My iPhone. You're logged in on your iPhone. Yeah, Show I, the camera. Right. Just, we got the camera right here. I this just, is unbelievable. I'm watching her do a search for This Week in Startups. And you're then, I, what I just noticed you did, and you then were she, zooming I, in for I a just, second. Yeah, I, I can zoom in. I just watched her click the link, and now she's on the This Week in website. Right, and you're zooming in. Yeah. Now, what if you want to ask a question to her? Um, Show how, look so at this Actually, interface. this is really cool. So I just 
pop up in the menu bar, hit chat. Right. I can pick who I want to chat with, either everyone or just her or just you. Right. Now. Uh, and I can tell her, like, hey, do a search for. Uh, yeah, just type in, like, do a search for this or whatever. Now, that's amazing. Uh -huh. But additionally. You know what I should do? I'm going to chat at you so you can see what this. happens there. This is my iPad. Now, I'm going to ask you to switch from the iPhone to the iPad, if you don't mind, which we can. Uh, either you can zoom in on, or actually we can, oh, you know what, why don't you just, oh, there we go, whoa, I'm spinning the iPad, whoa, whoa, <laughs> this is my iPad, the same meeting, flawlessly on iPad, and if, um, I could ask us to use the camera maybe, because we're capturing my iPad, but let's, let's tilt the camera over here, and zoom in, and let's zoom in on the bottom right here, now, if somebody were to chat, and I was on my iPad, somebody say something in the chat room, what you'll notice is, it pops up in the bottom right hand corner. Right there. Boom, Just that do. little green box is like a little alert, like, hey, yeah. something's going on. And this is the beauty and simplicity of GoToMeeting. We set this meeting up in just a matter of seconds. Setting up a meeting is so easy. Then you get that nine digit code that you just email to everybody with, or you just give them the URL, or both. They go to GoToMeeting, and in seconds they're in the meeting, whether it's on their iPad, their iPhone, their laptop, their Android. I think you could do it with ColecoVision. I think this, <laughs> they ported it to ColecoVision and they, they also uh, to TRS-80, yeah. you can log in with, and uh, also with uh, Super NES. All of those things work with GoToMeeting. Maybe not the last couple, but the uh, first one's PSP, definitely. Right. PSP, no, I don't know if they have PSP actually. I mean, it is mind blowing because sometimes I'm on uh, go to meeting. I don't want to have my laptop like I'm just hanging out by the pool or something. I'm in the right. hot tub. Yeah. I just want to pop out in a go to meeting and just be on my iPhone. But you can put your headphones in. You could be on the subway. You could be in an airport lounge. Take out your iPad. Take out your iPhone and do a go to meeting. Yep. And that's just the beauty of it. And anybody can edit it. It is flawless enterprise software. They only charge you by the month. It's not like they're asking you to do some big upfront payment. And it's stable. And you look like a professional sending a go to meeting link because the meeting starts on time. Don't screw around with those free options. The free options, you get what you pay for, and you don't get much. And I'm telling you, you're not going to get on an iPad, and you're not going to get an iPhone, and it's not going to work, and then you're going to look like a, you're going to look unprofessional. Mm -hmm. How many times have we done an angel meeting, or a launch meeting, or a TechWatch 50 meeting, or any of these meetings, yep. and somebody's like, oh, hit me on Skype, hit me on this, hit me on that, Google Talk, all these free services. Yeah. They, they never work. Yep. They never work. I mean, it's one thing if you're trying to well, chat not, with your mom, not, yeah. you know, or, you know, whatever, you're chatting with your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend. That's, you know, whatever. Okay, yeah, you Skype. When you want a serious business meeting and you want to have your desktop up and running and HD, beautiful, look at this gorgeous video of Carolyn over here uh, in the corner. I'm zooming into it. I mean, that's HD. You can't get that uh, in any other service. She's married, by the way. I don't want anybody to start emailing Carolyn and asking her <laughs> anything, okay? She's happily married. Thank you, GoToMeeting, for making my life amazing and for producing such a high-quality product that I am so proud to count as a supporter of This Week in Startups. And Tyler's very happy, too, because he doesn't like to be in the office. He's always in Thailand or <laughs> Vietnam or Japan Couldn't or Korea. Couldn't do it without you this week. Uh, yeah. Yeah, GoToMeeting. We love you. The guy who's running Yahoo, actually, was running your former company, PayPal. Right. Well, how does that make you feel as a PayPal alumni that the guy who was running mm -hmm. your baby right. is now a patent troll and a right. pariah in the industry? I mean, <laughs> well, you know, I never. You got to take it personally, don't you? I mean, well, not, not necessarily. I mean, I, I never work with him. You know, he yeah. he came to PayPal years after I had left. Um, you know, it. Uh, honestly, I have no ill will towards anyone personally at Yahoo. I'm not. I'm, it's not an ad. Hawk or, or ad hominem at all. They're obviously anyone. good people. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to send the, the message uh, by harnessing the community outrage that's already out there. I mean, I'm not oh. saying anything that oh, you're Mark throttled. Cuban, Fred, Fred Wilson. You're throttled. Those people are like, F at them. And right. the person who wrote the patents at Yahoo is yeah, saying exactly. they weaponized them. Right, exactly. The former employees are aghast that they're doing right. this. Exactly. So there's a general sense of community outrage. I'm just trying to harn harness it into constructive. Yeah. Solution. So yes, I'm trying to put some and fill some engineering positions <laughs> yeah, exactly. from the people who right. are inevitably going to leave such a, a right. terrible company that thinks right. that their best option is to sue people right. instead of. If you were CEO of Yahoo, what would you do? Well, that's a really tough question. I know but that's I, why I, I guess, asked it. <laughs> uh, What's the thing? What do you do day one? What I probably do? wouldn't have taken that job without knowing what I would do, and I don't. I don't know what I would do because right. I think it's very hard to turn around a tech company, right? I mean, people always mention Steve Jobs, the fact that he's the only one and he was like the greatest ever. I mean, it shows you how hard it is. Right. Um, and what did he do to do it? I mean, he just basically went in there and said, 50 products, now four. 
Well, and he invented a completely new, I mean, they went into music and then they leveraged yeah, that into media. It was they went into incredible. consumer electronics. They changed right. from a computer yeah. company. So, so a pivot and a focus issue. Yeah. So I, honestly, I don't know what I would do if, if I were running that company, but I, you know, I don't think that becoming a tra patent troll should be a, a, seen as a turnaround strategy. I think it's just a horrible, if that's the strategy or one of them, that's bad. This, just to yeah. span the company. Yeah, exactly. When you see PayPal, um, do tremendously well in one way, mm -hmm. like it's a brand for the ages. It's still right. loved, and you haven't been there in a decade. Right. Does it make you sad to see that the lack of innovation at PayPal, or like it, you see Square and other things coming out, all these different companies really innovating in financial services? Right. How do you reconcile that as an entrepreneur, like looking back at your baby that's not advancing in life? Right. Well, it's advancing from uh, the point of view of it's growing. So, it's growing. Yeah. So if you look at the payment volume today versus where it was when we sold it, it's like 10x. I mean, the whole thing is like 10 times bigger. Right. You know, I think if PayPal was a standalone company with its metrics, it'd probably be worth over $20 billion. I mean, it's, yeah. it's probably more valuable than eBay at this point. Yeah. So the thing is just like scale to the moon. Um, so that makes me feel good. I think it's got over 100 million users at this point. Um, you know, I think the reason why there's a lot of it's interesting, there's a lot of payment innovation now. You've got, you do have companies like Square and other companies are getting in, and, and PayPal has not exactly been at the forefront of innovation. I think part mm. of that's because they lost all the founding people mm. very quickly, and so they've lost sort of several successive generations. And mm. so it's hard to maintain the innovation when everyone who built it is gone. Right. And, so, you know, and it was such an incredible collaboration of people that yeah. it was the first group to be sort of noted at, for their post efforts. Mm -hmm as much for their previous effort, the PayPal Mafia, which right. were part of. You were, right. in the, were you in the photo shoot, the famous photo yes. shoot? Yeah. Um, what's, what is it like to be in the PayPal Mafia? Is it like you have right. meetings or? <laughs> I mean, people want to know, is this right. actually like legitimately it's, a group of people who collaborate? Yeah, it's, it's not a club. It's more like a diaspora movement. What basically uh, happened is, you know, our, our homeland got taken over, they burned down our temple and then they kicked us out. Right. So uh, we're more like the Jews than like the Sicilians or something like that. Got it, okay. Yeah. But now you've come back around and everybody's right. doing phenomenal. Right, exactly. When one PayPal person has an idea, do they circulate to the other PayPal people first? Mm -hmm. Or is it more ad hoc? Like, There's been a lot of co-investing in each other's startups. Yeah. So you know, Peter Thiel was the first investor in, in Genie and in Yammer. Um, so there's a lot of there, there's a lot of informal. Founders Fund is in SpaceX, Elon right. Musk's company. Right. Max Levchin was also there. Dave McClure um, was he there? Dave McClure was there. Yep, absolutely. Dave McClure, Max Levchin, mm -hmm. Elon Musk, mm -hmm. Peter Thiel, David Sachs, Reed Hoffman, Reed Hoffman, uh, Chad Hurley and Steve Chen. Chad Hurley, Steve Chen, <laughs> Roll up Jeremy Rosa. Stoppelman. Jeremy Stoppelman of <laughs> right. Yelp. I mean, just going down this Yelp, yeah. YouTube. Slide, 500 startups, SpaceX, Tesla, Yammer, Founders Fund. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is incredible. Yeah. That's unprecedented. It is, it is pretty crazy. What do you attribute it to? What was, uh, it in, the, what, what what was, was in the water? What was in the water? Well, th there's a bunch of different things that, that were going on. I think that um, one of them is that PayPal figured out a lot of things early about how a startup should work before blogging existed, before Y Combinator existed, ah. uh, before, you know, there's so many resources now for young entrepreneurs to kind of quickly get up to speed on, you know, whether it's like kind of agile development methodologies or kind of the whole lean software movement or just, you know, the whole iterative approach to product. Um, be, just being a product-centric organization, not like a partnership or biz dev-centric organization. Right. Uh, learning how to bootstrap off other people's platforms, the way we kind of bootstrapped off of eBay, we kind of mm. made them an involuntary platform for, for PayPal. So, uh, virality, you know, PayPal is one of the first companies to understand virality. So there yeah. are all these things that yeah, in order you send a payment, you need to just have somebody's email. Right. In order to get your payment, you had to log in. Right. So there are all these things that we kind of figured out that worked about the way you should organize a startup, the way uh, you should build your technology, the way that you should focus on distribution and, and growth. And so that all those lessons were extremely helpful for the whole next generation of startups. And I think it's those lessons would be less advantageous today. Mm. But you know, given that you know we sold the company in, in mid two thousand two, everyone uh, was pretty much gone by two thousand three. And then there was kind of this period from two thousand three to two thousand six, which was pretty quiet in Silicon Valley. You know, before kind of the, the next wave. And a lot of this is when all the companies you mentioned got got founded. So I think there was an I think. 
you know, when, when did TechCrunch, when did the whole blogging movement even start? That's 23, what? 2003, 2004. So yeah, yeah, it probably wasn't even until like 2005 that like all this- Things started to bubble up. Yeah, there's a lot of knowledge that got kind of codified and understood. Um, yeah. Now there's like Quora, sites like that. It's very easy for people to- Yeah, AngelList. I mean, it's easy to be an entrepreneur today. Right. It's hard. Or easier, yeah. And then also, you know, there's well, a what? finance network that was very helpful. Mm. Um, I also think that, um, you know, PayPal's experience was that it was a very, it was very successful, but it was a very tough success. Mm -hmm. So I think if you succeed too easily or fail too hard, there's not much learning. Ah, so, if you succeed too easily, right, or you fail too too hard, hard right. you don't learn a lot. It's right. in the middle. Right, exactly. Moderate success, hard fought success, right, but not soul crushing success. Well, I think there's some startups that just nail it like out of the box so quickly that mm -hmm. it's almost like they plan their flag and then boom, oil just shot up out of it. Yeah, and then they're we're running, done. Yeah, they're running around like just with pants trying to capture the oil, and then it's mostly yeah. about capping the well and making sure the thing scales. I mean, like you look at something like Twitter where they launched it, it kind of was kinda sideways sideways for about nine months. SMS. And, th yeah. and then it just blew up. Yeah, and like the thing's year gone two. Yeah. They've been through like three management teams, and they, they've, they've done, rolled out some good features, and they finally, you know, they've made it scale and everything. So yeah, I finally. Say, yeah, finally. So it's not like they've done nothing, but for the most part, the product is very similar to what it was. It's 60% you know. of the original product, 40% new, right. which for a five or six year old company is pretty, not really like a lot right. of feature enhancements. I mean, they've right. only gone through what, two revisions right. of the website? But it's just somehow the original product was good enough, it could just scale to the moon. And yeah. so, you know. Um, lightning in a bottle. Yeah, it was just total lightning. And so, um, and then on the other extreme, I think there are startups where I, I don't believe in this whole fail hard, fail fast thing. I think if you fail too hard, you just don't learn anything from it. Right. So, you know, with PayPal, we we were able to grow very quickly, but we also had brutal competition because we were competing with eBay itself and they owned the platform. And, so and you had fraud. Right. We had fraud, so we were just... Big problems. Yeah, you know, we were being attacked by every fraudster on the planet. The Russian mafia, all exactly. these guys yeah. were... Going crazy, but what, what about eBay? You were saying something about eBay. Competing. Well, they owned the platform and they were competing with us, so it was very scary. We were in a war, so we learned how to fight a war. You know, and, so everybody and, got tough. Yeah, exactly. And it seems like that group of people is extremely tough. Yeah. Well, what was, I, it, what was the culture like there? Was it extremely like Asperger's, brutally honest, <laughs> like yes. hardcore? It was. Uh, I mean, Elon Musk, right. you, Max Levchin. I mean, right. was, these are like. It was very truth-seeking, as a truth-seeking. Yeah, I'll put that in quotes. Yeah, meaning you fought a lot. Yes, there was there was actually like a lot of friction. I think we all respect each other, and that's why it worked. But right. we, you know, there was a lot of yelling sometimes. Yeah, and uh, we just cared about getting to the right answer. And we were also very paranoid. I mean, every day was like, okay, the company's going to die. How do we prevent that from happening? And so, as every day was like a, it's like stack ranking of like all the ways we could die, and like how do we basically eliminate those risks? Um, wow, there's a lot of that going on. Intense. It was very intense. Were those, I mean, putting aside your family and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, were those the best moments of your career, best moments of your life? Like those, like when you look back on those hard fought moments, mm -hmm. the ones with the yelling, the screaming, and the right. brutality, and the right. fighting, and the, the near death experiences, is, mm -hmm. do you look back on those with like some joy, or, or do you look back and I'm like, oh God, that sucked? Um, well, big. You know, I think what happens is because the experience was successful, you look back on it very positively. Right. I think if it had been unsuccessful, you'd look back and go, Bitter. oh, God, yeah. This is horrible. terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. So I do think that, like, what happens actually really uh, colors uh, the, the experience in hindsight. I wouldn't say it was, like, the best experience of my career. I think that, you know, what I'm doing now is as good as, as what I was doing then. But... Um, you know, I don't want to be one of these guys who's, like, in the good old days. The good you know, old yeah, days. So. Well, clearly now you're in charge. Right. I mean, you were president at one point of PayPal? Yeah, I was, sure? a, I was a chief operating officer. Chief yeah. operating officer. Yeah. But now you're the CEO. I mean, you, you know, get that, to, that, what's that the difference? Of, well, the difference, the difference is interesting. Um, it, uh, you know, when I was COO of PayPal, I felt like I could just take the most draconian course of action. Uh, like, I would always recommend to Peter, like, obviously the thing that I thought was right, but it was, it just didn't take into consideration, like, any factors other than, the right decision. That moment, and you know, if it meant throwing out a year's worth of code, I'd be like, I don't care if it hurts anyone's, the engineer's feelings, like, this is what we have to do, it's strategically right. Like, yeah. you have a, you know, when everything's not on your shoulders, you can see things in a little bit more black and white terms. Now, when the whole company is riding on you, and you're like the last point of decision. Heavy think, is the head that wears a crown? Yeah, so you, you have to be, I think, a little bit more nuanced in your, you have to be, I think, more multi-factor in your yeah. decision making. Yeah, you can't just say, this is the best for the company, we're doing it. Well, it's more like, I was very product-centric as a CEO. I'm still very product-centric as CEO, but now, you know, 
if, if there's a battle, for instance, between what sales wants and what product wants, like, I, you know, it's You have to keep the sales department happy yeah, and exactly. humming, and yeah. you have to keep the developers right. happy and right. humming along, and right. there's going to be some negotiation. Right, exactly, yeah. So it's, it's um, you have to see shades, I think, a little bit more when you're the CEO. Yeah. How has that been for you? Um, I, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's fine. I, you yeah. know, I like it. Um, it, um, you know, for me, I would still say that in the common denominator with both PayPal and Yammer is I like the product I'm working on. And mm. um, so for me, it still is about creating the product, creating a product that people are going to like, the whole world's going to potentially use. Um, so that, that's still, I think, what motivates me. But at the same time, we have to sell it, we have to market it, we have to service it. Is so. it the stakes are pretty high now if you raise that much money, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it gets much higher. I mean, this right. is the big leagues now. Right. You've been there one time before, but you weren't in the head slot. Right. Um, how does that feel? Um, you're trying like to get you're, me to say that, like, oh, you know. No, I'm not, I'm not trying shoulders. to get you to cry or anything. I'm just, <laughs> now it's not like, hey, it's Peter Thiel's problem right. if this doesn't work out. I mean, this is right. your problem. You know, this is right. now it's all you. It's all David right. Sachs. I mean. Right. Yes, you do feel a little bit more uh, weight on your on your shoulders. A lot more weight. Sure. I would yeah. Think. yeah. 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 And. I guess when we talked three years ago, 12 people, mm -hmm. now 300. Right. What would it be when we talk in another two or three years? What do you see the company? Um, gosh, that's really hard to say. I mean, I think, you know. That's we why have, I, I asked the hard questions at the yeah. end. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a goal around employee headcount. I mean, that's yeah. sort of, uh, it'd be more around users. You know, yeah. two years from now, I'd want to be at like 10, 20 million users, something like that, in, mm -hmm. in corporations. Wow. Um, maybe more, something, you know. Yeah. I think that's very doable. And that would require double the number of people or something. Yeah. I mean, How is it building a company here? You have 300 people in San Francisco? Um, about um, 240 are in San Francisco, and then we now got people all over the I US hear that the you can't even get real estate here anymore. It's just insane. It, yeah, everything's gotten tougher. The job employee, the hiring market's gotten tougher. Even real, real estate sort of office space has gotten tougher. What so. do you do? I mean, you have to start offices in other places to yes. bridge the talent gap? And yeah. I mean, this is something that I was uh, very against um, in my previous life. I felt mm -hmm. at, at PayPal and even at Genie, I felt like if I couldn't look over someone's shoulder from like a product point of view, like this, I didn't want them there. Yeah. And now I think we've just relaxed that because we're, we're actually, so we started off with uh, London as our uh, Europe office. It was primarily sales and service. Um, so it was sort of a customer mm -hmm. outreach arm. Uh, but now we're adding engineering there because we just can't get enough uh, bandwidth in the Bay Area. Even though we do great with recruiting and hiring because yeah. we're a hot company, it's still not enough. And so, but we're not alone in this. I think what's actually so is London um, cheaper than here, or is it um, no? It's probably as good. It's probably equally expensive, or maybe even more expensive. But for us, it's not about cost. It's about because opportunity. It's about yeah. It's about you know uh, throughput. You know, yeah. we've got very ambitious plans for what we want to build. We need more engineers to do it. But it's very interesting. We're in a wave now of. You know, a few years ago, the conversation was about whether other countries or cities could copy what Silicon Valley has. Right. And I, I don't think that particularly worked very well. No. But, but what I think is... For New York, maybe. Maybe, yeah. But I think what is working, and I think will really work, is I think Silicon Valley is exporting itself. Mm. So, like, we're setting up a London office. We're, you know, we're hiring everything you would need potentially start a company. Engineers, salespeople marketing build support. So they're now all being, uh, you know, inculcated with Silicon Valley values, like mm. how a startup is supposed to work, you know, the culture, the, culture, the trust, how you get VC money. So, because um, Silicon Valley is all about creating a trusted network. I mean, when we went out to raise our last round, 85 million bucks, I mean, we pretty much had term sheets within a week or two. The deal was closed about three or four weeks later. You know, where else in the world could you do that? You $85 million, you couldn't do it anywhere. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't do that in- Macau. <laughs> at a casino, maybe something for some illicit behavior. Right. I mean, yeah, can, maybe in Russia, if you were right. doing something completely illegal. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's VCs in London, but there's not a network of trust to get the deal done so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, you could, certainly couldn't do it in LA because everyone would be afraid you're going to steal the money. You right, know, you'd be running for the hell of these. Yeah, exactly. So, one of the reasons why it works so well is because DFJ, who led the round, can talk to our board members who they're in lots of other deals with. Right. And the other board members can tell them, yeah, this is what we've been seeing for the last three years four years. Right. So, you know, they're able to immediately... The fluidity is... So, so it's a trusted network and that allows yeah. things to move much more quickly. It's very hard to set up. If you're just trying to copy Silicon Valley, very hard to, to just copy a trusted network. It has to happen organically. You have to grow it. You have to grow it. And so Silicon Valley is now planting the seeds everywhere because now, you know, Facebook and Google, they're all opening offices and 
New York, Dublin, London, LA, and so. So there's a virus spreading. I think that's what's happening. I think Silicon Valley is exporting its culture. It's sort of what happened to in New York. You know, you have people like Fred Wilson, mm -hmm. or the Foursquare guys, right. or Tumblr. Like, it's a very uh, Valley ethos. I think. Right. Exactly. These are guys sort of of Silicon Valley who are going somewhere else, not people who are out of Silicon Valley looking in trying to copy what we have. Right. Yeah. They're in that's, the. That's. I think the the. Um, the, the, the viral model is much more likely to work. But it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what this means for the world economy over the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. What do you think is happening with employment and stuff like that? I know you like have um, right. some views on that. You're kind of thinking about these things in a big way. Mm -hmm. are, we in a, is the, are we in a permanent employment reset in the United States? Is the problems with unemployment based on motivation, education, systematic? You know, right. what's going to happen? I mean, people are right. very nervous about things. Do you think it's right. going to get better, sideways, worse? Right. Well, let's just start with the, the observation. There's this huge chasm where we can't hire enough people, good people in Silicon Valley, not just for engineering positions, which are obviously very hard to hire for, but sales. I mean, we, you know, we're trying to yeah. hire good sales people. Uh, and all the way and these are significantly, significant paying positions. Right. These are exactly. not these are great jobs. Walmart readers. Exactly. So we can't hire fast enough in the new economy. In the old economy, there aren't enough jobs. There's like tons of unemployment. So. There's a huge divide, and it's so it clearly is a skills problem. I mean, if all the people in the old economy could do the jobs in the new economy, they would have jobs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need way more people learning how to program. You know, we need far fewer people going into finance or other, you know, even sort of those types of jobs and yeah. going into programming and, and science, technology, exactly. engineering, math. So, there's a huge skills problem. That's a result of an education problem. Um, I don't think it's entirely an education problem because. Lord knows, like our CTO has dropped out of college. I'm not even sure that a bunch of our engineers have high school diplomas. I think they. You don't care. We and we don't care. You're like, can you code? Exactly. Here's a coding test. Go. So, so it's not. Is good. it good? Great. Right. So, oh, you graduated <laughs> fourth grade. I see. Congratulations. Awesome. Right. What did you do? Oh, you were a pirate <laughs> for your teens. Right. Great. Awesome. So we, it's not like we even need more people going to college if they just learn how to code. That would be good enough. Right. Um, they would be able to find jobs. So th there needs to be a realignment of of the economy and. Um, it, you know, it's it's happening. Hopefully, it will happen faster. You really think it's happening? Well, I mean, I, it's I, I, the, the signals are being sent. I don't know whether they're being received. Uh, right. You know. Um, interesting. You know, I think there are interesting cultural indicators. So, like the Social Network being a hit movie. You know, certainly that, entrepreneurship is yeah, it's in people's minds. It's kind of like what Wall Street was in the the mid '80s. You remember, right? Sure, like, everybody yeah. wanted to be Gordon Gecko. Yeah, everybody wanted to be exactly. And so, you know, if you listen to Michael Douglas, he's like, you know, I've been approached by investment bankers like a million times. Said like, you're my idol, and he's like, don't you get it? I was the villain, right? Uh, but they were, <laughs> <laughs> wait, are you saying Zuckerberg's the villain? No, <laughs> in this but, equation? <laughs> no, but he was saying like, it's just this movie has been so it was so influential culturally and in getting people to go to yeah, uh, to Wall they Street. went into banking, yeah. Because they saw the film yeah. when and they now, were young. Yeah, and I don't think Zuckerberg is a villain. Now, I think the no. movie kind of portrayed him as a little bit more of a mixed figure, but I think the point is that in the same way that Oliver Stone wanted to demonize capitalism, and I don't know what Aaron Sorkin's agenda was, but it wasn't entirely positive. Yeah. I think the way it's being received by the culture is very positive, and people are like, right. I want to do that. I want yeah, to start a, a startup while I'm in my dorm room, and if it means I can drop out of college in you know, my yeah. sophomore year, so much the better. Yeah, college is a waste. You agree with Peter Thiel's whole thing, like don't go to college? Well, um, you, you guys have, are you have pals. To do, you have to do something better. <laughs> so right. uh, don't drop out of college and just be a dropout and do nothing. But I, I, I do think that uh, certainly college wasn't necessary for our CTO. I don't think it's necessary for people who have something better they want to do. Um, so, so yeah. But, yeah. but obviously, in context, is the is the key there. Yeah, I guess, huh? I mean, you have to have something better you want to do. If you know, but and drive. Yeah, ex exactly. If you're going to drop out of college, if you're going to get off a track, you probably do need more motivation because the track helps keep you kind of moving to the next step in life. So yeah. for a lot, so like you said, for people who aren't super motivated, super motivated, maybe the track is helpful. David, continued success. It's amazing to watch you grow this company from just two or three people, the launch at the conference, and now 300 people and just tremendous user base. Amazing, um, real inspiration. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, thank, thank See you, you in three yeah, years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and we'll see all you guys next time on This Week in Startups.